Hi, my name is Karthik Chandran. Today I'm going to tell you about work that's been done to understand how Ebola virus invades human cells. This is the first step in the viral infection cycle that allows the virus to gain access to the cytoplasm of the cell where all the goodies are to make more viruses. And this is an absolutely crucial step for the virus. Um, we think of it really as a molecular ballet between the virus and the cell because there are all these complex interactions between molecules in the virus and molecules in the host cell. And studying this process is giving us insights into the nature of the disease caused by Ebola, but it's also giving us new ideas to develop therapeutics that target not the virus particle itself, but rather components of the host cell that the virus absolutely needs to have in order to infect it. So this is an iconic image of an Ebola virus particle, or virion. It's all over the internet, and I'm sure you've seen it everywhere. But this isn't really how we think about the virus. Instead, we think of it as a complex machine, as shown in this image, with many different components that do different jobs. Every component of the virus actually has multiple functions. This is a different representation of an Ebola virus particle, what we call a stripped wire or lipstick model. The core of the virus shown in yellow is the viral RNA genome, um, which encodes the genetic information of the virus. And this is uh, wrapped in the nucleocapsid, which is a multi-protein complex. Together with the genome and the nucleocapsid, as well as the matrix shown in green, the virus has the payload. This is the part of the virus that actually needs to be delivered into the cytoplasm. And the payload is uh, transported into the cytoplasm by the delivery system of the virus, which has two components to it. The first is the viral membrane or lipid bilayer shown in gray, which wraps this entire genome and nucleocapsid payload. And embedded in this lipid bilayer are trimers of a viral glycoprotein. So each of these glycoprotein complexes has three subunits. It looks like a fan blade. And it's this protein, GP, that actually carries out the invasion process that allows the payload to be delivered into the cytoplasm of the cell. So how do we actually study the Ebola invasion process? As many of you know, um, Ebola is a highly lethal virus that can only be worked with in a, a high biocontainment lab where the researchers are wearing these special biohazard suits. The way we get around this problem is we take advantage of the fact that GP is a modular protein and it's able to do its job in a completely different context than the intact Ebola virus particle. We take advantage of the fact that we can use a completely different virus, vesicular stomatitis virus, or VSV, to study the Ebola invasion pathway. VSV is also an RNA virus like Ebola. It also has a membrane, and it also has a glycoprotein. And what that allows us to do is to replace the glycoprotein of VSV, which is called G, in this blow-up of the genetic material of VSV. And we can replace that glycoprotein of VSV with that of Ebola, i.e. GP. And this allows us to generate uh, VSVs expressing Ebola glycoprotein. And so although this virus is still VSV, the invasion process is really determined by the Ebola glycoprotein that we've put into this particle. So this uh, surrogate virus, or what we like to think of as a, a sheep in wolf's clothing, allows us to study exactly how the Ebola glycoprotein mediates the invasion process. And of course, anything we find using this kind of system has to be confirmed using real Ebola in a BSL-4 laboratory, which we do in collaboration with our BSL-4 partner, John Dai, as I'll talk about a little bit more later in the talk. So this is actually an image of the kind of infections that we can get with this VSV particle carrying the Ebola glycoprotein. One of the little features that we have that makes it really easier to study infection is that we've introduced a gene into this VSV called the green fluorescent protein, or GFP, which allows us to track individual cells as they become infected. And those are the little green dots that you can see in this slide. So this is actually quite a, a handy system to study Ebola invasion. Work that we and a number of others have done over the last 10 or 15 years has led to the following model for how Ebola virus invades cells. First, the virus has to bind to the surface of, of the cell. We haven't yet identified any essential cell surface proteins that the virus needs, but what we do now know is that Ebola sort of masquerades as a piece of debris that the cell wants to engulf and destroy and recycle. And so once Ebola binds to the cell, it's taken up into a membrane-bound compartment called an endosome. In this endosome, something quite unusual happens to Ebola. It has to be 
cleaved by a host enzymes or proteases which actually cleave proteins into pieces this is normally a step which one thinks of as really bad for viruses because essentially viruses are being delivered into a recycling shop inside the cell that's really there to break down and recycle uh, raw materials and indeed most viruses that we know about actually like to escape from this endosome before they get too far down the track into the recycling machinery. Ebola, however, actually needs these enzymes, these cysteine proteases that are involved in chopping proteins up, and it's evolved to be cleaved or chopped up by these cysteine proteases in a very specific way, as we'll see in a little bit later in the talk, that these cleavage events are absolutely crucial for Ebola virus invasion because they then allow Ebola to bind to a protein that's in the membrane of the endosome called NPC1, which is a receptor for Ebola. This is a protein that Ebola absolutely has to bind to in order for the invasion process to take place. Once Ebola binds NPC1, and again, this binding interaction is mediated by the glycoprotein of Ebola, there are a series of complex events that we haven't completely defined yet that allow the glycoprotein to essentially pull the viral membrane close to the membrane of the endosome and get these two membranes to fuse together. This is called membrane fusion, and the result is that the internal contents of the virus, the so-called payload, can now be delivered into the cytoplasm because once the membranes are fused, what's inside the virus is now inside the cytoplasm. So the cysteine proteases that Ebola needs in order to bind to NPC1, and NPC1 itself are two potential targets that one could go after to develop therapeutics for Ebola. We think of these uh, host components really as almost like a GPS system that you use to uh, navigate your way from one place to another. The virus is using these host molecules to orient itself during the invasion process. And if we take away the ability of the virus to exploit these host molecules, the virus is essentially lost and cannot successfully escape into the cell. So how has understanding the viral invasion process helped us to target Ebola? First of all, the Ebola glycoprotein GP is the target of all the Ebola vaccines we have, as well as this cocktail of antibodies that have been given to a few individuals called ZMAP. When you inject a VSV vaccine, actually it turns out that the VSV Ebola GP that we use for our research is one of these candidate vaccines that's being developed by two companies. Um, when you inject this vaccine into a, a human, the person develops antibodies that are targeted against the virus, as shown here on the right. And we know that one crucial thing that these antibodies do is that they actually bind to the glycoprotein and pin it down. They almost act like molecular staples that prevent the glycoprotein from undergoing these complex conformational rearrangements, these dynamic changes that need to happen in order for the glycoprotein to do its uh, invasion function. And in a way, they're almost like these burly wrestlers that are holding onto a gymnast and preventing the arms and the legs of the gymnast from moving apart and thus preventing the gymnast from doing uh, his or her routine. And in the same way, these antibodies prevent the glycoprotein from mediating the fusion of the viral and the cellular membranes. But one of the questions that we and a number of other folks are asking is, instead of targeting the virus directly with antibodies, for example, can we target the host proteins that Ebola needs instead? So as I told you before in the model, we know that Ebola needs these molecular scissors, these proteases in the cell, to jettison a shield that's on the surface of the virus. And this shield needs to be removed, as you'll see in a second, because the virus needs to remove it to bind to the NPC1 receptor protein. One of these molecular scissors or enzymes that the virus needs is called catapsin L. And here is a structure of catapsin L bound to a molecule in its active site, which tells us that we can actually make small molecules that target these kinds of enzymes and prevent them from cleaving the virus. The reason why Ebola needs enzymes like catapsin L is because a piece of the viral glycoprotein called the glycan cap has to be clipped off by the enzyme and reveal this uh, binding site where NPC1 can actually fit into. And if you don't have this cleavage, the virus can't bind to NPC1 and therefore it's lost. Um, it can't escape from the endosome. And by inhibiting the protease, we can actually prevent this cleavage from taking place. Shown on this slide are examples of a few candidate inhibitors that we've developed along with a number of collaborators. What you can see here is that as we add more and more of these compounds to cells, we can inhibit um, viral infection 
in a dose-dependent manner. And some of these inhibitors actually work at really, really low concentrations. For example, this compound R11ET blocks Ebola infection with an IC50 of 5 nanomolar, which means that you only need 5 nanomolar of this drug to inhibit Ebola infection by 50%. This is a kind of potent activity that you need in order for a drug to be useful against a virus. And so this does look promising. However, we only have data in cells so far. And so one of the big challenges for these and other kinds of drugs is that we actually have to be able to get them to work in animals and eventually in humans and then show that they're safe and available in the body to actually um, block the enzymes in cells so that the virus can be inhibited. Now we turn to the second protein that I mentioned earlier, NPC1, or neiman pick c one which is a protein that helps transport cholesterol from endosomes. So this is a, a normal cellular protein. This is an ancient protein that for billions of years has been doing this job of taking cholesterol that comes into the cell and transporting it across the endosomal membrane. And it turns out that when this gene is lost in humans, it causes this rare neurodegenerative disorder called Neiman-Pick disease because cells accumulate with cholesterol. But we found, along with a group of collaborators, that NPC1 is also doing a completely different job, which no one had appreciated, which is that it is acting as a receptor for Ebola virus. So we know that once Ebola goes into endosomes and gets cleaved by cysteine proteases like catepsin L, that it can then bind directly to the NPC1 protein, and specifically it binds to the second domain of NPC1 shown with the red arrow, domain C. And this binding is absolutely crucial for the infection, the invasion and infection process. What happens when Ebola can't bind to NPC1 because we've taken it away? We've generated cells that don't express NPC1. What happens to the virus in these kinds of cells? What we find when we're comparing wild type versus NPC1 mutated cells is that the virus is, is able to bind just fine to these cells as shown in these series of images, and it can actually be engulfed by the cell. So delivery of Ebola to endosomal compartments appears to happen normally without NPC1. Instead, what happens in these cells that don't have NPC1 is that uh, the virus accumulates in these large structures and it can't escape out of the endosomal compartment into the cytoplasm. So the, the role of NPC1 really is to allow the virus to fuse its membrane with that of the endosome um, so it can deliver its payload. This is all fine because NPC1 is clearly important in cells, but what happens in animals, which is really the question that um, we need to know the answer to. We were able, again with a group of collaborators, to do a series of experiments to ask what happens in mice that don't have NPC1. Remember I mentioned that there is a disease called Neiman-Pick disease um, where individuals don't express the NPC1 protein. Well, there are also mice that have the same genetic defect in NPC1, and we can use them to study what happens to Ebola. So when we take normal mice and infect them with Ebola, most of them die within 8 to 10 days post-infection, which is what you typically see. However, NPC1 knockout mice, so these are mice that have no NPC1 whatsoever, cannot be killed by Ebola at all. And surprisingly, even mice that uh, have only one copy of NPC1, which means that they have half as much NPC1 as normal mice do, are substantially protected. So even just removing half the NPC1 in the mouse gives it some kind of advantage against Ebola virus. So this is just looking at uh, the outcome. What happens to mice? Do they live or do they die? So we next look at actual growth of the virus in these animals, and um, we first see that in normal mice, you get high amounts of virus. Um, so in this case, we're getting about a million uh, infectious viruses in one milliliter of sample from different tissues in, in the mice, as shown with the red circles. In contrast, when we look at what happens in the NPC1 knockout mice, we see absolutely no virus at all. So it's almost as if when the mice don't have NPC1, Ebola can't even see the cells to be able to infect them. It's essentially blind without this NPC1 protein and entirely unable to be able to invade the cell and set up an infection. When we look at the mice that have half as much NPC1 as normal mice, we see an intermediate result where some mice have got rid of the infection, but other mice are still making virus. So we think what's happening here is that when we take away half the NPC1, the virus can still grow, but it's affected in some way so that 
this buys time for the immune system of the mouse to mount a response and clear the infection. So this fits with the fact that a lot of these mice do survive. And it does suggest, does raise the possibility that if we could make a drug that reduced the amount of NPC1 temporarily that was available to the virus, we could potentially provide protection to these individuals against the virus, even without having to get rid of all of the NPC1 protein. And of course, when you don't have NPC1 forever, then you develop this neurodegenerative disorder. But this is a very slow, progressive process. In contrast, when you have Ebola, this is a highly acute infection, the outcome of which is decided within a week or two weeks. So we think that if we can reduce the amount of NPC1 in patients partially or completely for a short period of time, we should allow these individuals to be able to fight off the infection. So the conclusions from these experiments are that NPC1 is crucial for Ebola infection and disease in an animal model. And even partially eliminating NPC1 provides mice an advantage in controlling the infection. So this is really the million dollar question for us and others, which is, can we target NPC1 to block infection? It turns out, in fact, that there are many FDA approved drugs that are non-specific NPC1 inhibitors. And so here are two examples, toramiphene and amiodarone that are um, approved for completely different diseases or indications, and yet these turn out to actually have a protective effect against Ebola. This turns out to be because these molecules are cationic amphiphiles, which means that they are both hydrophobic, which is shown with the red arrows. They're sort of greasy, in a way, if you wish. And they also have these positively charged parts of the molecule that are circled. And it's this combination of being hydrophobic and being positively charged that somehow allows these compounds to go into endosomes and block NPC1. However, we don't really understand how these compounds work. However, because these are FDA-approved drugs and have been shown to be safe in humans, they are being investigated as possible emergency therapeutics during this ongoing outbreak in West Africa. So we had a different question, which is, can you make anti-Ebola drugs that specifically target NPC1, rather than somewhat non-specifically like these cationic amphiphiles do. One bit of evidence in the literature um, really gave us some, some heart that this is doable, because it turns out that there is a closely related protein to NPC1 called NPC1-like 1 or NPC1-L1, and this protein is also a cholesterol transporter, except it isn't everywhere like NPC1. It's only expressed in the small intestine, and its job is to move cholesterol. When you eat food, the cholesterol goes into your intestinal tract, and NPC1-L1 helps to absorb this cholesterol into your body. And it can be blocked by a drug called Zetia, which actually binds to the same part of NPC1-L1 that Ebola is using in NPC1 for infection. These are different proteins, and, and it turns out that Ebola cannot use NPC1-L1 for infection. However, we think that the fact that you can make a drug like Zetia suggests that we might be able to do something like this for Ebola as well on this related protein, NPC1. And in fact, uh, Jim Cunningham's group at Harvard has developed a molecule called 3.47, shown here at the left, that is able to block Ebola infection, as shown on the right. As we add more and more of the drug, you can reduce infection by Ebola with this compound, while it does not affect infection by a completely different virus called Lassa fever virus. So it is possible, in principle, to develop these kinds of inhibitors targeting NPC1. The problem with this particular compound is it doesn't have great properties in the animal in terms of the pharmacology of it, in terms of being available to actually inhibit NPC1. But you know it does provide an important proof of principle that such inhibitors are possible. To discover new inhibitors of NPC1 that directly affect the ability of this protein to act as a receptor for Ebola, We've developed, together with our collaborators, a set of assays that allow us to directly measure the binding of these two proteins that have been stuck on different kinds of beads. And when GP and NPC1 bind together and bring the beads together, you get a signal that can be measured. And a small molecule drug that can bind to NPC1 and prevent these beads from coming together no longer gives you the signal. And using this kind of assay, we've developed a new class of NPC1 inhibitors that can actually block the ability of GP and NPC1 to bind and can also block Ebola infection. So shown here on the left are three different inhibitors that can bind to NPC1 and block its ability to bind to Ebola. And shown here on the right is the ability of the same compounds to block infection in cells. 
So this tells us that it is possible, again, to make compounds that can bind to NPC1 and prevent um, Ebola from using this protein as a receptor. Again, with all of these kinds of molecules that are targeting host factors or host proteins, the challenge is to go from cells to compounds that actually work in animals and are safe, which is where a lot of these molecules are, are kind of stuck at the moment. So in conclusion, the cell invasion by Ebola is a complex multi-step process. I, I hope I've convinced you of this. Leading Ebola and vaccine drug candidates use antibodies to block infection by pinning down the viral invasion protein. Ebola uses its own, exploits our own host molecules in all our cells in this really sophisticated way to guide its invasion process. In the process of doing that, however, these host factors become potential Achilles heels for the virus. And two such host factors are host endosomal proteases like catepsin L and the Ebola receptor NPC1. And um, scientists in the field are trying to develop drugs that go after these host factors that Ebola needs. Going after such host factors as drug candidates has potential advantages over virus-directed treatments, but there are also challenges, um, and I'd be happy to discuss both of these in our question and answers afterwards. So to close, I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in this work. First of all, I'd like to thank my lab and several of the individuals that have really featured in some of the work that I've presented, especially Esther Ndungo and Melinda Ng, and Tony Wong and Emily Miller, two former students in my group. I'd also like to thank all of my collaborators, without whom this work wouldn't be possible. John Dye is our BSL-4 collaborator at USAMRIT, who does all of our confirmatory work using real Ebola. The discovery of NPC1 was made in collaboration with John, as well as with Tyne Brummelkamp at the Netherlands Cancer Institute and Sean Whalen at Harvard. I'd also like to acknowledge the other collaborators listed on the screen who are working with us on a number of different projects related to Ebola invasion. Thank you.